Hello everyone, this is Andre from the Mental Health and I'm here with Dr. Akeem Soule, who is here in Birmingham with me at the VAP meeting. Hi Akeem, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Really enjoying the conference. And you've just given a talk at the yes. conference yes, in I the have. kind of bringing clinicians and academia together session. Tell us all about what you were speaking about. Yeah, so basically I was asked to speak about the collaboration between NHS clinicians and academic clinicians and to explain how that could advance the cause for psychopharmacology. So I started off by saying it's not so much about psychopharmacology as an end to itself, but it was more about how we could progress that collaboration to improve better care for our patients. And I introduced a number of concepts. I spoke about the natural curiosity of clinicians. So I spoke about how clinicians ask some very nice questions, for example, about oral depots. An example of an oral depot would be penfluoridol, which is a oral medication which you can give once a week. Those are the kind of conversations when academics and clinicians come together. And I spoke about the concept of why no one has thought of a long-acting injection antidepressant. Maybe they have, but I've not seen it developed. And especially with this debate about antidepressant discontinuation symptoms, one would argue that if you had a long-acting injection antidepressant, you would have, you could manage the hyperbolic tapering a lot better. The other thing I brought up was about how, looking at philosophical terms, we should look at naturalism versus normativism. And the basic concept is this. Naturalism is a very reductionist approach. And that's the whole thing about we've got brain disorders, we've got a disorder located in this part of the brain. Whereas normativism is more about things being value-led. And I said that maybe as psychopharmacologists, we need to shift from being strong naturalists to more of a soft naturalist. So appreciating that, yes, there might be brain disorders linked to the brain, but also appreciating value that a disorder is defined by the patient's perception of it or what society defines it as. And what that means is that in the research by psychopharmacology, we're more likely to include qualitative studies, look at things like social determinants of mental health, things like housing and racism and how they influence psychiatry. And also that could explain why, even though we have treatments, some of our patients don't take our medications. Just basically turning things on their heads, talking about how we, we need to be a bit more innovative in terms of the research that we do, looking at social determinants of mental health, co-producing with patients, asking the questions that patients want. Because I think sometimes psychopharmacology can be very biological. I'm not against biological, but I'm saying that it's important to consider the other factors as well. Because at the end of the day, we're dealing with patients. The other issue that I brought up was about how the researchers in psychopharmacology need to reflect what we see among clinicians. So among clinicians in the NHS, especially in psychiatry, we've got a lot of people, ethnic minorities. Now, if you're saying that there's an increased risk of psychosis among people of African or African Caribbean communities, what we've seen as many of those researchers doing psychopharmacology research, it seems to be like white capped mountains. And these are the difficult conversations that we need, we need to have. What I particularly pleased me was that I also was able to get a Kendrick Lamar quotes there. So the title was not like us. And I explained up how Kendrick won the battle against Drake by basically making reference to cultural cachet, cachet which he accused Drake of not having. Fabulous. Uh, you, I don't think I've ever seen you talk about anything and not refer to Kendrick Lamar at some my, point. My favorite MC ever. But you know, along with a colleague of mine, we have this thing called hip hop psych. But I've recently, I've been analyze it, doing more work on movies and TV shows. If you Google me, you understand you, you would find stuff on talks I've done on The Sopranos and how that relates to mental health on The Wire and also on shows like this Mikhail Coel's show, I May Destroy You. So I've done a lot of talks. I've also done one on Top Boy, which was published. So if you Google me and also I'm on Twitter at ak 411 cam some of the work I do, you, you'll be able to check my work out there. Worth checking out, yeah. I guarantee it. Thinking about what you were saying there, I'm yeah. interested in the kind of cultural perception yeah. of mental illness, because you're talking there about the social determinants of mental yes. illness, and you're talking about the way that we perceive as scientists, yes. psychosis or depression or whatever. Bringing in that cultural element doesn't feel like that's part of this no. group. So how, how do we bridge that divide and why is that important? Yes. 
think it's important because in certain cultures, for example, when you talk about concepts of psychosis or depression, that can be perceived as being spiritual in origin. And yes, you might have good medication, but patients will not necessarily take the medication if it doesn't fit into their perception of it. So what's going to be very important is how you make those communications. And that's why I think that with psychopharmacology, it might be important to do cross-disciplinary work. We see work do, being done at the Wellcome Trust. Just looking at things like qualitative studies, why people don't take medication, their perceptions of illness, because you could have the best treatment in the world, but if patients don't think it works or if their illness model doesn't fit into it. And as a clinician, that's one of the things that we as clinicians have to work around. We're used to doing it. But I think psychopharmacology in research needs to be able to incorporate, incorporate those elements into it as well. I was talking to a psychiatrist from Denmark a couple yeah. of weeks ago at a conference in Belfast all about personality disorders. Yes. And he was talking about the importance of um, ICD and the importance of diagnostic categories yeah. and the importance of scientific language like personality disorders, yes. but saying I would never use it with a patient yeah. because it's offensive. Yeah. It's just the way that we as a system perceive this thing. Is that going on here as well? Yeah. What kind of language yeah. do you use when you talk yeah. to people about mental illness? Yeah. So again, the personality disorder is difficult. You could see both sides. For some people, I think the problem with the term personality disorder is what, what the perception was in the past. So in the past, when there weren't effective treatments for it, people got a diagnosis of personality disorder and then it, it was used to basically deprive people of care. What we do know is there are lots of evidence-based psychological treatments. So transference-focused psycho psychodynamic psychotherapy, we've got mentalization-based therapy, and we've got dialectical behavioral therapy. And we've got like good practice management, which we've got under structured clinical management. Now, when you have an effective treatment, sometimes it's a bit easier to explain personality disorders because you now have effective treatment and it's not being used as a tool. So I guess you could argue it both ways. But I think the wider question about diagnosis is what it means, because we know there can be a lot of stigma. We know for certain communities, when you have a diagnosis of mental illness, that can affect, especially when it's community-based, that can accept, affect your ability to marry, the ability of your cousins and sisters to marry. And so sometimes education needs to be had. And that's why one of the things that I'm very interested in is psychoeducation, which we do through hip hop and TV shows. Because I think sometimes TV shows can get it right. And of course, sometimes they get it wrong, but at least you can have the discussion. So an example would be for ECT treatment. For my older patients, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I, I think it came out in 1973, I believe. And so a lot of the older generation, they see electroconvulsive therapy, which is an effective treatment for severe depression as a punishment treatment. So if you're aware of the TV show, you can actually address that. You have TV shows like Euphoria, which talks about drug use and teenage angst and depression, where you can begin to have those kind of discussions with young people. You look at The Wire, you look at Top Boy, and you can see a character like, for example, you could see a character like Laura, and then it lends credence to the Embrace Report, which talks about the high risk of suicide among people with perinatal mental illnesses in ethnic minorities. So, you know, we have all these great TV shows, music that we can begin to look at cultures or people that do, wouldn't necessarily engage in conventional ways. And I guess the issue is that, as you say, because the system yeah. is white and racist, yeah. Yeah. the culture that is currently being consumed by people who work in the system isn't necessarily top boy. It's maybe some opera or I'm typecasting, but how can we bring that together? This diversification, which yes. is so important. Yes. So again, talking about philosophy, because I know I've been, I've been mentioning a lot of philosophy because in Birmingham, you've got Professor Yubode, whom he's going to give a speech. He's very much into philosophy, poetry, and Professor Broom. But there's this concept called control of knowledge. And control of knowledge is this concept about who defines what is knowledge, who creates the hierarchical structures about what's considered to be knowledge. And if that is a Western, white, washed perception of it. What tends to happen is other people's understanding of knowledge isn't necessarily involved. And this has nothing to do with wokarati. Before you say this is tofu eating, weight rose attending wokarati. But it's more about 
being aware of these different na narratives, different ways of knowledge and being able to co incorporate it because what's most important is how we can make the research relevant to the community, make sure the treatment reaches people and make sure that if they're, when they're effective treatments, people take those treatments. So having these understandings help, understanding their models of illness, what they, their knowledge is really important before we can take these effective treatments to where it's needed. I always love listening to you. You're such an important voice in the UK mental health, public engagement. Please carry on doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.